Thank you, Terry. I'm here because of Terry. Um, the last time I was in this town was six weeks ago, or a little more, when I came in at about this time of day and got on my bicycle and rode to Jackson Hole, and I, I uh, felt I finished eight minutes before the closing bell. It took me 14 hours and 22 minutes to ride the loaded jaw ride, and I, it was a victory. I was unprepared, but uh, I feel a little bit that way here because, like Cody Stewart, I'm not a specialist in in any of these natural related natural resource related issues. I'm an accountant by training, but I have spent my whole career and my growing up working the land. And uh, so in any event, uh, I have uh, a lot of experience from the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, the Ensign Group is a family owned business that uh, my brother and sister and I have put together and I've spent uh, the last 25 years assembling a collection of ranches. We have about a quarter of a million acres of deeded land and we uh, run on another three quarters of a million of uh, forest and BLM and state lands, mainly in northern Utah and southwestern Wyoming and southeastern Idaho. Uh, for the last 20 years, I've had the experience and pleasure of being involved with the Nature Conservancy, most recently as the vice chair for the la of the Utah chapter for the last several years. And um, in, 19 in 2008, I decided when Summit County switched from a three-person commission to a five-person part-time council to run for office, and I've been elected twice to that office and I'm midstream in my in my second term and I'm actually running for the state legislature to, to represent District 54 which is Park City in Wasatch County and then as a part of collecting uh, I say collecting as a, assembling a lot of uh, private land we also uh, have our, our, our goal in, in doing this is uh, we do some real estate development, but primarily what we're trying to do with these large landscapes is to keep them intact and find renewable ways of generating a return so that we're not mining them for, for short-term gain or something. I've used mining loosely. We're not uh, sacrificing them, but we're trying to find ways that in the long run we can keep Keep, do sustainable things with them and still make a living. And um, so in any event, uh, I put this slide in here, Summit County, uh, in spite of its blurriness, because sometimes a lot of the issues we're looking at do look a little, a little blurry. Uh, the, uh, the Nature Conservancy, what I love about the Conservancy is its mission is to preserve land and water upon which all life depends. Now that all life is human life and everything else in the biological world and both you know plants and animals, flora and fauna and so then it does throw, so through collaboration which is really through balance. It's not an either or proposition, it's an and proposition. We need energy development and we need species preservation. And it also does so in a non-confrontational way through usually a willing buyer and willing seller or through partnering rather than through litigation or trying to take things through a down zoning or something. Uh, on the ensign group, to be a little more specific, we have two operating entities Ensign Ranches of Utah, which as the name implies is what, what we do business uh, under in Utah. And then Aramo Corporation is named after a chief Aramo of the Bannock Shoshone Indians in a little town in Bannock County where I had the privilege of growing up in the summers and got the agricultural bug as a, as a, as a pipe mover. We operate in those counties uh, there that I've listed and uh, we, we try on all of our lands to, we, we believe biodiversity is richness and so we're trying always to enhance that and uh, we do a lot with fisheries and, and we also uh, try to protect our big game so that we wind up having uh, at the 
allowing them to mature so that they can be high quality animals. These are just a few slides. Here's a branding. Here we, we operate in Twila County. We have a cow calf operation. We summer our cattle in the eastern part of the state, Ensign Ranches does. And then in Skull Valley, we have extensive uh, private land holdings and, and some farms where we raise forage and, and we are a stalker operation and, and have some irrigated croplands. Uh, and here we're cutting some triticale that we're going to ensile in Skull Valley. These are just some shots from our holdings in Summit County. We, one of the interesting things as it relates to energy is that uh, in 1995, we acquired uh, the, all of the Utah holdings of Philip Frederick Anschutz. The Anschutz discovered the, in the the, the largest, the East Anschutz, Anschutz Ranch East is the, was the early and one of the big discoveries in the overthrust. And we now own the surface estate and Anschutz and Anadarko and others own the mineral estate, but we have had a lot of interaction with energy development, traditional oil and gas in that, in that area, uh, especially now as the field is playing out and in trying to reclaim wells. This is one of our fisheries uh, at Heiner Canyon Ranch on the north side of I-80. This is, that was the upper reservoir. This is a lower reservoir looking down. And uh, these reservoirs are maintained purely as still water fisheries. We don't, they're not, they're not storage reservoirs for irrigation. Um, here are some of our, we, we specialize in, uh, we don't have any competitive advantage in large elk, but we do in, in trophy mule deer by letting cadres of deer attain a six, five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half year old age before harvest. We've had pretty good re results uh, in that. So now uh, I'm going to shift my talk to sage grouse. Uh, my wife was the office manager at Deseret Land and Livestock from 1979 until we married in 1991. And uh, at the time, uh, I, when I was dating her, we would go to the ranch. And Deseret, as many of you know, is a, is a 200, 1,000 acre, mainly private ranch in, in Rich in Weber and Uinta counties. And, uh, it's now owned by the LDS Church. But anyway, we were up there and she was driving an old Ford pickup. I told her to s slow down. There's a grouse in the road. And she ran right over it. And I told her to stop the truck. And I threw and it. She didn't run over with the tire. It just kind of not in the bumper or something underneath the vehicle did it in. So I threw it in and ate it. That's the last grouse I've eaten. But I've seen a lot of them. And I had to, saw t had to marinate that a long time. Grouse live a long time, and, they, and they, the old ones are pretty tough. But uh, in any event, you all know that on the 5th of May of 2010, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service determined that the sage grouse were warranted for protection under the Endangered Species Act. But they, the listing was precluded at this time because there were other higher priority species. And so, um, they identified two problems, this habitat fragmentation and lack of adequate regulatory mechanisms. And so the, the, the thinking is, is that uh, they will be reviewed again in 2015 for listing. So Governor Herbert, to his credit, and following the lead of Wyoming, decided to create a, a working group in order to come up with a state plan. And the theory is here that if the Western states will group together and take care of the sage grouse uh, threats, that the Fish and Wildlife Service will not list it. And it will be a preemptive move. And uh, there's urgency now in order to do this because uh, while the listing may not occur for a couple of years, the federal land management agencies want to they're, they're reevaluating re their plans and they want to adopt Utah's uh, and, and these Western states as their plan if they're robust enough. So that they, rather than have on federal lands a different set of rules, it would be the same on federal and state lands. Here are the members of the 17 members of the working group that have been meeting since February off and on. You see up there, uh, 
Kathleen Clark, who's former uh, director of the BLM and, and is chairing it and works for the governor, and then a long list of the first ones are Fish and Wildlife, BLM, uh, Forestry, NRCS, Commissioner of Agriculture, I won't read the whole list, Kevin Carter of CITLA, uh, Mike McKee, uh, Mark's co colleague here from Uinta County, and uh, another Davis County, and Box Elder County Commissioner, Terry's on the committee here, and uh, those other people are Joan DiGiorgio from the Conservancy, and at the bottom, the facilitator was Bob Budd, who used to actually work for the Conservancy in, in Wyoming, and is a rancher, and, and facilitated the creation of the Wyoming plan. Um, the the uh, working group divided the, the state into 12 sage-grouse management areas, and those numbers shown on, on the side here are the 10-year average of count uh, of, ma of males uh, for all lack within the area. So in Bald Hills, there's an average of 68. And you can see these different areas. I'm going to focus your attention here on Rich, Morgan, and Summit, which has the largest 1,223 average males attending the lack. Uh, so it also divided the land into three different types, habitat, and then within habitat there are the leks themselves, which I assume you all know what a lek is. Uh, they're a very interesting thing to watch. Uh, it's where the males strut during the breeding season, and I uh, there's one real close to uh, Park City where I live up. Uh, it, it's fun to go early in the morning and it, it's, it's really amazing. I counted 50 or so just on this one lek this spring. But anyway, so it's nest, then nesting, brood rearing, late brood rearing, and wintering areas. And then non-habitat is where land obviously where it's not part of their life cycle. And then opportunity areas are areas where for some reason or another, it used to be habitat or it could become future habitat. And uh, the, as in many things, if you've ever done any wetlands mitigation or, or, any, uh, or if you're seeking a 404 permit, there's this hierarchical uh, protocol for disturbance. First seek to avoid, then seek to minimize, and then seek to mitigate. And that's the same here. Now. Um, in, with respect to the lakes, lex, this uh, they came. The, the the what I'm these slides I've been showing you are are the information that was given in to the governor in a draft of the recommendations from the working group on the seventh of September. So, the working group has has given its results, and and what I want to point out to you some of the I'm going to from here on describe some of the concerns with, with what's going on and give you an example. But so here you have obviously tried to avoid human disturbance on the lek. The lek may only be, you know, 10 acres or something. That's not a huge thing. Uh, permanent tall structures should not be visible from the lek. Uh, windmills, wind turbines and uh, transmission towers for transmission lines, distribution lines you know, can, you know, that's a kind of a red flag. And then the, uh, you shouldn't produce noise greater than 10 decibels of, uh, of the background during the breeding. And these uh, time of day and seasonal disturbance stipulations, those are, those are probably not a problem. Now here's where we get into an interesting thing. Around each of the leks, there's a presumption that there'd be a four mile radius. And when you do the math, you pi r squared, you come up with about 50,000 acres. So each lack has an influence on, uh, you know, on over a township of, of property. And uh, the, um, you, you know, obviously you try to avoid, and if you can avoid and minimize, then th this plan is calling for mitigation done in advance at a four to one ratio. I want you to keep that in mind because that is a, a, a pretty high bar, not only the ratio, but doing it in advance. And of course, to mitigate, you have to do it on non-habitat. Uh, the, the, the cumulative disturbance needs to be less than 5%. So uh, even if you mitigate, it, it, it's got to be less than 5%. And then these other, the tall structure and noise stipulations that I've mentioned earlier. 
Now the wintering areas, again, you avoid. It has the same, uh, I should, when I say new cumulative disturbance, I mean that existing disturbances are grandfathered. They're not counted. Uh, so there's no need, there's no requirement to mitigate for an existing disturbance. Um, and and uh, so this 5% cap is in force. Maintain tall sagebrush. The idea here is that the, the sage grouse require feed that sticks above the snow. And, uh, and then this bottom one is sagebrush treatments. We do a lot of, in our business, have done controlled burns and seedings and other things for range improvements. And this is an effort to, uh, to, to con these would have to be approved before uh, we did more than 20% of the habitat. I, the, a lot of the questions on these percentages is of 5% of what? Is it of, of what I own and what I'm trying to do or is it of the whole management area and how do you allocate that? What if I want to go hog wild and do you know, a huge amount on my property and my neighbor that I take his, I ta I take his opportunity? We'll get to that in a minute. Um, now, the county government in this plan is, local government is, is where the plan is supposed to be instituted. Now, as a county council person, I always try to envision the, you know, when I pass an ordinance or amend a general plan or something, if, when the rubber hits the road with that plan, how am I going to administer that? Is it, is it practical? Is it ambiguous? Is it clear enough that we can, that uh, somebody who doesn't have a PhD in this can apply it to, on a case-by-case -case basis and be consistent? And uh, so the idea here is that, that, that um, these provisions would be incorporated voluntarily uh, by counties into their general plans and that there would be incentive-based protection and enhancement on private lands. I'm going to mention I want to highlight that for you now because while that sounds good, the, the big question mark on incentives is who pays for it, how do we do it? It's a nice platitude, but the devil's in the details. And then the, these would be incorporated uh, potentially into land use standards in, in the county planning and zoning. So this is how this plan would be rolled out at the county level. The, uh, there's been I said that on the 7th of September, this plan was communicated by the working group to the governor, and there were, it, it's far from a consensus plan. It's a, a, a good attempt maybe to try to frame some, uh, uh, I'll call it maybe a wish list, but there's lots of parties that were among those 17, uh, lots of those 17 around the table and others in the working group have submitted comments showing concerns, and one of them, of course, uh, is a patchwork quilt among counties and lack of consistency. If you're in the oil and gas business and, you know, now you cross a county line, you have a whole new set of rules, and, and again, is that, is that going to allow the kind of governance we want? And then I mentioned earlier these unfunded uh, incentives, the platitude of we'll have incentives, but how are they paid for? And then how are these caps allocated, as I mentioned earlier? Uh, so I want to focus now um, looking at my particular part of the world. I call it my part of the world because not only am I one of the five members of the legislative body that controls part of this part of the world, but I'm also uh, re a representative of the companies that own certain aspects of this part of the world. So we're going to look at the summit uh, Rich Morgan County Management Area is an example. In 2008, I uh, bought, bought uh, five anemometers and started measuring wind on the Porcupine Ridge area. And, and uh, serendipitously, the, uh, uh, some department here at USU did a study on the economic development uh, impacts of wind, wind power. And they used my Porcupine Ridge project as an example, as the example. Uh, and anyway, so we've been measuring wind for the last uh, four years. And, and while our net capacity factors are not terrific, uh, the, really, uh, as some say, Wyoming sucks or Wyoming blows. The, the low-lying wind 
the, the low-lying fruit is in Wyoming, and when you have a utility like Pacific Corp that has a broad coverage area, they're going to go where if you can spend $2 million per megawatt of capacity, do you want to spend it where it'll run 30% of the time or 40% of the time? It's not very hard to figure. And so our net capacity factors are borderline, but I still have hopes, and I'm working with some developers to create a commercial-sized 50 to 100 megawatt wind farm on the south side of Interstate 80. And uh, then um, I mentioned the Deseret Livestock Ranch. My father and two partners owned the ranch from 1953 until 1974, at which time they sold it. And uh, the, the group retained three quarters of the mineral rights that uh, to the extent we owned, Amanda Darko owns, it's, re it's the railroad grant, and so there's a checkerboard land tenure in that area. But we own uh, significant mineral rights uh, under the Deseret Livestock and under some of our own lands. Anschutz retained those on the south side of Interstate 80, but we own the minerals on the north side, which happened to be where the largest sage grouse population is, so I think we do need to get rid of the geologists. The only problem is we haven't had the great success yet in, fi in finding, uh, we've, we've done some exploration over the years. Um, but so here's the Lex versus the wind turbines, and this is hard to see, but this is, this is the uh, Rich Summit Morgan management area. Each of these uh, tan circles is a lek surrounded by a four mile radius and you can see that uh, there's quite a sweet spot in here. This is for reference purposes, this is Echo Junction and this is Interstate 80 and this is the state line going into Wyoming. This is Uinta County, Wyoming. This is Summit in Rich Counties, Utah. Over here, this is a layout and it's hard to read of, but here's the same formation, the state line here Interstate 80, and, and we own surface estate in this area here. This is Deseret, we own surface and mineral in here, and we own mineral under here. But we have, uh, just, this is very preliminary, but we've let, and you can't see it well, but these little lines are where arrays of wind turbines, where they would go primarily on the high ridges uh, in order to capture it. This is Lex versus exploratory drilling, we have a lessee on the Deseret Minerals uh, that is currently working on the Crane 16-4 looking in the Bear River formation and we have these other prospects that uh, we're wanting to drill. This, this area has been elusive. We've, it's, uh, we had a lease for years with Amoco and they uh, drilled many wells and, and uh, we figured we were on the wrong side of the tracks. Anschutz was on the right side and we came up short on, on the north side. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the, the most recent uh, Rich Morgan Summit map and this whole area is, is identified as habitat. You'll see in here that this whole pink area is deemed as habitat. And so really, what, if you know the geography at all, here's Chalk Creek, here's Echo Canyon, and the, most of the rest of this is national forest, but this is all private land. But basically, every acre that I have anything to do with is habitat, and every acre basically east of I-84, this whole block is habitat. That's important because when you go to say, and, and it's shown again here, it's not easily discerned, but the, the cross hatching is habitat. So this whole area is cross hatched with a few exceptions. These lighter areas, and it's not in good focus, my eyes aren't in focus anyway, that's opportunity areas. So there are a few little opportunities areas and there's very little non-habitat. So, um, what, where the problem lies is you want to develop anything, a home site, a, a location for a well, be it horizontally completed or just a one-off, one-shot, 
or uh, you, you know, a wind turbine, you disturb an anchor, you stay out of the lack, right? That's, that's probably the easy part. Now you want to go somewhere within, within habitat, you've got four mile radius, you've got to then put um, a mitigate four to one, but you have no land to mitigate on because it's all habitat. So you have no non, in, in our county, and, and in my personal situation, if I'm trying to be self-reliant and take care of, you know, I want to drill a well, okay, I, on my own land I've got to mitigate. I have no place to do that because the whole darn thing is habitat. And so um, I guess it, it, it gets down to balance. And uh, I'm very hopeful, and, and, and you know, Terry mentioned is, preserving endangered species, the new battleground for energy development. This is going to be a game changer in the state of Utah if the state were to adopt a plan similar to these recommendations. Uh, because it would be, uh, in many ways, you know, a, a huge uh, due process violation in most circumstances due to a takings where there's, I guess there is due process, we have an Endangered Species Act, and it's being applied at the state level, but it's, it's not, in my judgment, the kind of balance when I hear uh, Bill Barrett Corp and Steve Block of SUA get together, or Anadarko, and they get together and say, okay, we can do business. This sort of plan is not a balance between preserving economic development and property rights, at least as I try to apply it just to my little part of the world, let alone try to administrate it as, it a, as a county council member, but just the equities of it, of trying to balance. Um, and, and so there is, what's going on now, as I said, on the 7th of September, it went to the, to the governor, but because when we met a week ago, and I'm not on the working group as you noticed, but I've been asked or I volunteered to serve on a, a subcommittee to try to make some sense of it, to try to find, is there a, w a way to make it work? And the, t the second to the top person on that working group, Larry Chris, the Fish and Wildlife Service, they're the ones we're really trying to please in a way, because if, they, if they're not pleased, this will just go in the trash and it'll be listed anyway. If, so finding a balance there, um, questions are, is this state plan really better than having it listed? Uh, you know, that, will the, will, at the end of the day, will the governor and will the legislature sit idle while, you know, while a plan like this, if, you know, if, it, if it isn't improved to where it can be more of a consensus plan, that is the balance. This is, this is one-sided, I think. I, 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 I very much appreciate the, and find worthwhile, finding an acceptable state plan. That's a laudable goal. That's the way I like to do business. Finding common ground, working together, sitting down, and not having a cram down or some third party. Uh, but I, 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 I don't really know where this is going. I don't, I don't see right now that, uh, if we were to just, and as I said at a working group meeting, if we were to just kick this upstairs to the governor, how the governor's office would reconcile these recommendations with lots of uh, other, other comments. So here's my contact information, and uh, I, I'm told I have a minute. I, I don't know if you want a question, or if there are any questions, I'd entertain those, and if not, I'll, I'll sit down. Thank you for your time.